Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Honestly, it's an honor to be able to make it to uh, DEF CON Switzerland. So um, thanks for coming out to the talk. Um, as you see, we'll hopefully get into some detailed discussions on how can we apply machine learning to malware classification and malware detection. So without any further ado, let's move forward. So just my background real quick. I'm currently blessed to be a computer science graduate student um, at Purdue University, where I am studying lots of artificial intelligence, machine learning, as well as natural language processing in order to apply and create ensemble classification mechanisms to better detect malware of the future. Not what we know today, but what we will see in the future. That's what I'm currently working on. Um, before going back to graduate school, I had 15 years in industry, including being a creator um, and the director of a cyber operations um, training schoolhouse, as well as a computer science instructor and research director and, and many other things. And then I like to learn some stuff. So um, hopefully it will be a good ride today. OK, so some things on what to expect. So we'll get into the research motivation. Why are we doing this? Why do we care? How might we be able to apply, as we mentioned, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning into malware classification? And then hopefully we can get into uh, a live demo. It's going to be a little different live demo because I'm working off of a Jupyter Notebook to help run the tools that we've created. But we'll, we'll, we'll try and get into this and get through it. So I always include the live demo gremlin. And that's because whenever we get up here, we've always tried things to work time and time again. It works perfectly. But as soon as we hit play, sometimes things crash. So that happens. I'll do my best to modify and, you know, just keep this, keep this moving. And then the last thing, just our disclaimer, you know, the views and the research that we're doing is just on behalf of me, uh, me with my university, but um, it definitely does not represent the views of the Department of, uh, Department of Defense or the U.S. Air Force. Okay. So research motivation, number one, um, as, as this, this quote kind of says, you know, any sufficient advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And here, what, what I would like to do, I kind of want to take us on a journey of how we could be able to learn to apply just artificial intelligence to whatever is our cyber defense domain. Whatever we want to do, the workflow is very, very similar, especially when a few years ago, I did not know how to do any of these things. But being able to apply a, like a deep dive into learning it, I would like to, you know, release what we've learned so everyone else can be able to, you know, apply this and then move forward to help your security enterprises um, as a whole. But uh, generally, you know, things that are advanced, as I say in the research, there's no such thing as magic. You know, if we know how things run and work, then we'll be able to de define, describe, and also enhance in the future, for the most part. But deep learning, you know, artificial neural networks, there is a little magic there that even experts don't know exactly what's going on. Um, but everything else is clear, and we'll try and talk about that um, today. Now, since we talk about classification, kind of like the, the, the elephant in the room, which some experts, like as you all are here, you know, you might think, well, others have studied and spent a lot of time doing malware classification, trying to apply machine learning, artificial intelligence. You know, why are we continuing to do this? Additionally, people might say, well, we have the AV, you know, we have stack, we have full cloud, we have compliance, we have insert your next generation X platform, or individuals will say, like, we have software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, service as a service. And so we might think that, you know, we have everything we need, so we don't necessarily need to continue to focus and spend a lot of time and effort on machine learning with malware classification, you know, but that's not the case at all. Here's an example. In this slide here, we're talking of the explosion of like repositories with code that has AI and GPT, your generated pre-trained models, and GPT like assisted code in the development. And so now we can see like a trend of how code and repositories have increased over the years, and then where there's been a significant climb from the like establishment and the launch of like GPT-3, now GPT-4. Over here, this is kind of like the, a huge explosion occurred like in 2022 when ChatGPT, you know, kind of came mainstream for everybody. And then we can see like AI assisted code and et cetera, you know, that's always going to be included. Like we are, you know, we will never get away from using artificial intelligence and in what we do and in what we create. But here's why we still need to focus on classification and applying new models to detect these things. And that's this. So what about private repositories or private GPTs that do not have guardrails? Because the GPTs we use right now, they do have some sort of guardrails. If you know how to do some prompt engineering, you might be able to get around some of those. But there is protection mechanisms to keep it from giving recommendations or hallucinations you know, that can make you to do bad things. But private GPTs may not have these. 
And so what happens when we take a good repository of lots of code, lots of malware, and then we, we have the GPT generate for us, give me new code on how to attack X system and Y system. That capability already exists. And so it's important to know that this is coming already in the future. People are already working on this. And so what happens now when we just use AI to generate all of our malware? You know, we need to be able to detect and to prevent against that. Here's something else. So ever since I you know, started talking, et cetera, like since 2012, I always have some sort of statement that I say malware continues to advance in sophistication and prevalence. I have an example on virus total. So at the end of February, early March, I looked at like what are the daily uploads that people are submitting to virus total. So according to this site, uh, according to the site that we have here, so virus total reports that on a daily average they receive over two million unique su submissions or two million submissions per day. Of those two million submissions, over one million are unique samples that are submitted to virus total every single day. That's a lot of generation. Now, one thing to keep in the back of our minds is, okay, AV, the AV that we use, how often is that up, up, updated? Once a week, perhaps? Well, once a week, you know, in cyber time, that's like multiple years. Talk less of many years that we've been using this type of technology. So it's definitely something that we need to focus on. And so that's why our motivation is that we have to be able to apply new strategies to detect and to, and to defeat these threats. And so we have done that, and we would like to release a lot of our work and our research to everybody else in the field. So as we work on this, this brings us now to our formal problem description. Kind of four that we will, we will focus on today. Number one, there lacks like a standardized, uniform language that describes static analysis, dynamic analysis, and artifacts we can extract from memory analysis. And so in a uniform way that we can now share and like learn and immediately pivot into multiple models of different generation. Some may say, well, there's sticks and there's taxi. These things exist. Yes, but it's not formatted for malware analysis. We can use it, but it's not made for that. And so that's why there's a big problem here. Number two, we do not have a good language that describes this. And then there are no like large or there's no system that helps us automate the creation of these data sets that we can now pivot into analysis. Three. When we look at the analysis as possible, we also do not have, I, I would say, a large corpus of already pre-computed data that now we can do analysis. If you look at the literature of people who apply machine learning, et cetera, into malware classification, there are lots, like the more that you read, the more commonalities you will see. The more commonalities you'll see will be like the, uh, I would say, the, the malware families or the corpus that people are using in order to create and generate new models. A lot, and that still exists today, people are relying on like downloaded corpus um, from over 10 or 15 years ago, 2010, Amber data sets, et cetera. And that's what we're still seeing in publications today. And we said that's state of the art. You know, so there's a problem, there's a lack here that we're here to address. And then lastly, there lacks an ensemble model that's able to classify these large and disparate data sets and still to be able to provide high precision and accuracy. So I'd like to focus on these in our research. Yeah, so I wish, I, I think because I've, I've run through this, I'm like, I, I don't have time to talk about um, a lot of the keywords um, that I put up here, but for, for us who are interested in this concept, well, where do we get started? Here's a, here's a start. So if we look at some of these words, we can Google, and now we can see, or YouTube, and see how can we apply these different concepts towards artificial intelligence and machine learning. Because these words are very, very similar. You'll see this come up time and time again. I, I, I wish I have time, but perhaps if I can speed through this, we might be able to come back so we can talk like how do you better apply you know, these words into our research today. Okay, so um, one thing I will mention multiple times is this concept of a model. You know, what is a model? Well, a machine learning model, it's a, it's a, a process, an algorithm um, that we, we learn and we are able to extract patterns from the data that we analyze. And then we use what we've learned in different parameters across the data to help us generate predictions. So that prediction could be like a forecast, or the prediction could be a classification, you know, association. These things be, rely here or there. But we generally use models to help us make this decision and then, you know, to be able to predict and forecast in the future. When we deal with models, we also have like parameters that are applied to the variables that are coming in. So in this case, we have a simple um, function that we say, okay, weights um, can be one type of parameter um, that's uh, applied to our function. And then if we look at our input variables, just like your, your X 
um, that's coming into a function. So we want to understand which weights can we apply to each variable of x that's coming in to help us make a prediction. So that prediction will, you know, in this um, presentation, we'll use our y hats to talk about this is the predicted value of y as opposed to the real value of y. Moving forward, kind of to summarize, if we have an example at this side, so if we have a function here, a simple function that if I have input variables here that are coming in, x, and then I have different values of x, we want to be able to learn from like historical data and see, okay, what does y exist for my specific value of x, and then can we generate a regression line? So if we can learn like what is the closest regression line to the data that's coming in, then we can now use this model to help us make predictions in the future. One quick use case is like, okay, if I'm an, an investor or a venture capitalist, I want to loan money to different people, um, you know, to, to go out and establish different businesses. If a person wants to like buy, buy a house, and now today I can look at historical data, but for the last 10, 15 years, a house at X price, how much does the value of that house increase every single year? You know, with all things remaining equal, no crashes in the market, even though a macro analysis, markets crash, but a micro analysis, markets, you know, it always goes up and you can actually find that regression line. So I can figure out the parameters um, as the investor. I can now say, okay, if you want a million dollars, like what's going to be my return on investment in three years or five years? If I have a sufficient amount of data, I can now predict to see what will be my new return. This is how we can apply a specific model to help us make predictions. Now, there are many different types of machine learning, like supervised, unsupervised, you may have heard, reinforcement learning, et cetera. So in this, you know, in, in our talk, we'll only talk about two main types, which is your supervised and your unsupervised type of learning. Whenever we talk of supervised learning, this generally means that our, our data that's coming in, it's well, like, it's, it's well labeled. Um, I have a specific defined features, and names of the attributes for the features that I'm working on, and then I know what my output Y is supposed to be, like my ground truth value, I know what that is. So as I go through different models, I can now supervise and see how the model is performing and then make changes in order to you know, generate the best type of prediction or classification for us. On the supervised learning, we have kind of like two main things that we want to look at. I kind of spoke about this at the beginning. Classification type of uh, analysis. So I want to like look at an entire class of individuals, of binaries, and then can I learn the different attributes from each sample to now say, okay, this group of binaries, you know, this is like a config worm. This group of binaries is like con um, like emotet or Dooku or flame, et cetera, based on the features that I have coming in. That's the type of classification. The previous use case that I mentioned, that's similar to like your regression in which I look at values, apply different parameters and weights, other types of functions that can now help us make good decisions. And then, you know, again, we make predictions and forecast from that type of, of analysis. Unsupervised data is a different type of machine learning in which we, we, the data may be labeled or may not be labeled. And so we don't really know. But one of the things we may want to extract from this type of analysis would be like clustering, association. Um, for instance, there's a good use case on like um, Target. It's a, a major company in the, in the U.S. And that they can look at your buying patterns and then make the best recommendations on, hey, I think you forgot to buy this. I think you forgot to buy that. There was also a case that I believe they were sued because they can see like what people are buying and then start to predict, ah, you're pregnant. You know, so you might want to have diapers, you might need, you know, baby wipes, et cetera, based on just the simple, small items that you've done in the past. You know, that is a good application of, of machine learning in which we're looking at, I, I don't really know, like, what my prediction might be yet, but if I can cluster this based on everyone else who's been pregnant in the past, we can now say, okay, I'm seeing some association, this may be the case. Amazon is also really big in this, Netflix, et cetera. They're looking at previous patterns, and then again, they're making associations and then decisions. Or we can use this for dimensionality um, reduction as a good use as well for like unsupervised type of machine learning. We don't have time, it's outside the scope of this presentation, um, but there are just these main types you know, that we will consider for today's um, presentation. Okay, now the workflow. And so I care a lot about those, this workflow because you can use this on many types of analyses in the future. So whenever we do machine learning, and now we want to apply and do analysis on data that we have, well, we always start with objectives. In literature, they may refer to this as business understanding. 
And so when I have data, you know, you, you don't just dive in. Like, it's, you'll, you'll get lost. Like, there's, there's a lot that we can do. There's a lot of time that can be wasted. So the first thing is, okay, I have data. Let's try and figure out what's here. What do I think we should be able to extract from this type of data that's present? What are our goals, research hypotheses? You kind of write these down, and you spend time there first. Then we go into the huge task of data collection. So the data collection piece, like this is where a lot of our time is going to be spent, in which either we can extract data from structured databases, structured um, individuals or, or websites, et cetera, or use is going to be unstructured raw, and now we have to use different functions and analyses to standardize this and then um, throw it into our models to come. From that standpoint, we can do some sort of like data exploration. Other literature will, will refer to this as EDA, like your exploratory data analysis, that we want to say, okay, what's, what's present? What are some means and averages? What might I expect? Okay, let's go back and update our research hypotheses to begin with. Then we may also want to label our data, and then we always spend some time cleaning the data. So no matter what you have, we usually have to, to clean it, get rid of like anomalous data, like deal with some sort of outliers that can affect like the way our model will start to make predictions. From there, we can tr um, do like transformation, you know, change things as necessary. Then we move into the feature engineering. So here, as we mentioned, we need to be able to have like in supervised learning, like well featured or good attributes for the data. So now I can provide this to our model in order to make, uh, allow it to make decisions for us. And then there's also like feature synthesis that we might take like different features and then have composites from those in order to move forward. Then like this, I think, and the modeling, like if, if, or at least me, before I was starting this, right, and I'm, I'll hear the word artificial intelligence, machine learning, I'm always like, hey, the modeling part, you know, that's the sexy part. You know, you think like so many things are happening at the same time, et cetera, you know, it's modeling. You know, but truly, 80% of your time, you know, is spent on this side, like data collection, understanding the preparation. Once you have your data formatted, if you look towards the application of machine learning models, like you throw it in some model, you just wait. And like you, you wait for the model to make decisions. You check, well, how well did it do? Okay, it didn't do well. Let's go back and you know do some more um, engineering on our features to try and make it better. But to start with, we'll apply different models that exist. We'll learn. We'll, we'll do like some benchmarking. Then we start to program our own models, and then we compare: is it better or is it worse? Now, after we have multiple models that we've used to learn from the data that we care about, we move into evaluation, just as I mentioned. Is this, are these models good? Are they appropriate? Can they make new predictions for us in the future? This is what we mean by generalized. Can we, can we accept the decisions it makes for unseen data to come in the future? So important words that we care is like a loss function. Well, how far away is this regression line from the, the like the ground truth? And then the, you know, the line that's smallest in deviation from the ground truth. Hey, this is a good model. So we accept that to make new decisions for us in the future. Okay. Then when we, we've done this type of evaluation, we select a model or a group of models and then we move towards deployment. So the deployment is simply taking what we've learned, taking what we've created, and now you know we're using this in the real world. So back to our venture capitalist, hey, if I want to make an investment five years from now, is this investment going to be profitable based on the area that you want to go into? If the answer is yes, based on what we've learned, then let's, let's, let's have at it. Let's give it a try. If it's a no, then we can already use this to help us make decisions on like what would be the best objective way forward. Okay, so I spent a lot of time kind of building up the foundation of what are we doing and why are we doing this? Well, how does this apply to malware and classification? Okay, well, here we go. So we talk about multinomial classification. This is um, having like different, different results for the data that I have coming in. So a binary sample is rich in standardized details that we can extract and throw into our models if we know how to do this conversion and transformation. So it was mentioned yesterday, and, and I, was, I was at a talk in the afternoon, that if we look at a binary sample, there are multiple headers that we can extract, different sections where code and et cetera reside in the sample. And then if we know how to read this, we can now take these data, we can create attributes from this, and then we can load it into our model. We'll, we may have time to come back to this in the future, but one of the things that we have to do in our code is whenever we have a sample, we want to understand, okay, if I want to make good predictions, especially on a new sample that I've never seen before, how similar is this sample to other like true known malicious families or other malicious samples in the past? We should be able to give a percentage. We should also say, well, this, this sample, like it, it has the same behaviors. It performs the same way. It looks and smells the same as everything else we've seen in the past. How do we do that? Well, we have to be able to execute a deep inspection 
of the dis disassembly of the binaries, standardize that, and then th throw it back into our models and different natural language processing in order to make decisions. Okay. So to kind of help guide, like, all right, well, what do we extract from a binary sample? We said kind of, if you look at a sample, these are like six main areas that we can see, like how do we organize all of the data that we want to bring into our model. So if we see at the top here, metadata, that like we all start with, like what are the metadata and the characteristics of the sample? We can do specific analysis on the library functions of that um, specific sample. What, like, what capabilities might it have statically, or can we extract these dynamically? Then we can look at syscalls, depending on the operating system and the architecture um, that we're working on. How does this sample interact with the low-level operating system and the kernel? We can extract these, normalize these, and then do um, different types of language processing off of this. Function and opcode. So this is a really, really, really big one to, to truly say, like, this sample exhibits the behavior of other, you know, samples that we've seen in the past. So that in the future, when we get a sample, we have no idea. At least we can say, based on what we've learned, how it operated at the time that it did certain characteristics, this is malicious. Or this may not be malicious. We may need to study that further. Then strings, possibly, um, but we can look at different lengths of what's present. Like, you know, if I have lots of samples that say, you know, insert Bitcoin, go to this website, all of your files are locked. If I see that very commonly in the same language and the same vernacular, I might be able to now classify this type of sample as ransomware belonging to a specific family. And then lastly, event tracing. So if I launch it dynamically, we can see, like, okay, what does it actually do? capture those, and then, as I mentioned, throw it into some sort of language processing so now I can begin to cluster and say, okay, this is malicious, this is not malicious, why or why not? Okay, virus total. Now, as, as a place where we can receive data, uh, just quick show of hands, anyone use virus total? Familiar with that, that site? Ah, oh, very good. So, very good, most of us, um, most of us here, excellent. So virus total is actually a really good site that we could go to extract the data that we just spoke about on the previous slide, this one. So here, if we look at it in the behaviors or the basic properties section, well, this is where a lot of your metadata can come from. Library functions, it actually tells us these are the main libraries as well as the functions within the libraries. And then on this side, it does some sort of analysis telling us it may execute this function or that function using the MITRE ATT&CK framework, which is a good standardized framework that we can now capture and then do learning off of that. The only problem, um, accessing like virus total, you know, for free is, is useful, but there's a cap, you know, there's a limit on what you can do. So um, large corporations like virus total, they may charge quite a bit of money in the U.S., hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, to be able to access the data that we want to standardize. I know this because I went to them and said, hey, can I have access to your data? Can we share, you know, from our university to you? What would it cost? Like, you know, access to us is going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars just access to their data. It's like, my God, okay, fine. Well, I'm going to recreate exactly what you do, and then when we're able, we're going to release it all for free. You know, if you know how to extract and read the binary, um, just as we mentioned. So if we go into the feature extraction, well, how do we do that? All right, I like doing things in pictures. So here is a workflow, again, of how do you go from that binary sample into our machine learning to now make decisions. So we start from the corpus. Whatever malware, you know, bodies that we can get and extract, like, let's bring that down. And then we extract each binary sample, and then we, we do our analysis, we do our feature extraction, we normalize and reconcile um, different data that's not present. Sometimes there's lots of optimization that could occur in the binary between the compilers that are used. So how do we normalize that still to now be able to send a uniform data into our models? And then when we do all that, we now have a knowledge base that we create full of data, and then we have to be able to translate that data into a more uniform way. So what we do, we take this process, and then we create a binary abstraction based on the main components that we said before so we can regenerate like what that sample looks like while we're still able to eliminate the noise. Whenever we do modeling, we have to be able to eliminate as much noise as possible because we want to be able to say our prediction is based off of data and not random noise that you know, could just contaminate um, like the true work that's actually present. And then here, we just go into our machine learning, just as we said before in our previous workflows. Okay, so I mentioned, hey, there's an entire process here, so what does that actually look like? Okay, let's go to another picture. Okay, so here we are again. Now I'm showing like the different corpus that you can actually use to extract large amounts of data from. 
So we take each binary, and then I, I wrote a user agent, multiple agents, on the Remnux uh, Linux distro. Because this one already has lots of tools pre-compiled and installed for us, so it's a great tool to use. So now with our agent, we now automate our binary analysis. Okay, which tools do we use specifically for that analysis? Well, there are many. In fact, there are even more than I can even fit on the slide, but I'm just trying to show a few of the tools present that we have our agent, our malware analysis orchestrator, use on each sample in order to extract data. Now from here, this is a bit, you know, kind of complicated, so we try and summarize the details that we can get from each binary, each sample, into your main components. So we can understand, okay, I can extract details and these, these, like these types of ways is where I can use this program to give me the details that I need for my analysis. All right, now we can go into our data preparation. When we automate this entire process, okay, this agent goes away and now we introduce a new agent. This is our file descriptor. The file descriptor comes in, it looks at all of the data that's dumped, like gigabytes of, of data that's already present. Then we extract the specific features that we need and now we start to create that knowledge base. So I mentioned there's a reconciliation and normalization that needs to occur, because each tool might say a word differently, but we need to normalize what those tools are saying for us. When we are good with what we're extracting, and our agents, as I said, this goes into your knowledge base. Then we can take the details from the knowledge base and do that translation in order to produce the tables that we are now able to send into, into our models. So it's not like, okay, I'm gonna do artificial intelligence, AI, go and, go and do the thing. You know, there, there has to be processing in place. We spoke about the workflow. Here's one workflow that can work that we use right now to do the entire um, malware analysis process. And then again, we go back into our machine learning and then to deployment. Okay, let's go into demo. So, you know, I, I said a lot, you know, what does that, what does that actually look like? And I, I hope, I hope we have time to go through everything. I also hope this doesn't crash because um, I ran it earlier, but you know, you, you never know because now we're doing it live. Okay. All right, so in the code that we're going to release, and actually we're expecting to release this um, at the end of June, and so just following uh, either our Twitter or GitHub or so, you know, we're, we're going to have all of this released so it can be useful for everybody. Now, as I mentioned, it's, it's a Jupyter notebook. You know, it's one way of kind of using or interfacing with Python code in a, in a web interface so we can make notes and then also kind of share what we're doing in a, you know, in a unified, um, in a unified manner. So the first thing that we, we actually take, in fact, I, I should be able to run some of these. Okay, so anyway, um, we configure our tool, we bring in our imports, et cetera. I just want to move down towards the phases of analysis um, that we spoke about before. Um, let me go towards feature imports and stuff. These are some functions that we built in. Okay, here. So this is, this is kind of like where we start. So with each sample, we have our orchestrator that already analyzed the data, kind of put it into like some unique format. And then that unique format is what we're now bringing here to load and to establish to our models to now make decisions. Okay, so I didn't show kind of like what that, what those details look like. Um, let me see if I can do that real quick. Okay, here's an example. So here's a specific binary that, that we, ex we extract and did analysis on. Um, so one of the things that we need to do is like a deep inspection. So if we've ever worked with binaries, like I think we're very comfortable seeing, you know, this assembly. You get it? Like, here's the blonde, here's the brunette, and the redhead, just right there, all together. So, you know, like, we need to be able to do a deep inspection of the different mnemonics and the words and the capabilities that the binary is doing. So that's what our analysis orchestrator and our file descriptor does, and then we can extract some of our summaries from that. So some of the summaries that we want to see in this, um, in this entire, like, sample, okay, we want to understand where each function, where the functions start, where the functions end, and then, like, what what, what is the flow of each function? One way to help us would be, okay, if we focus on the APIs that this sample wants to use, okay, let's extract that. Let's extract kind of the calls a little bit before and after. Let's now standardize that to say, okay, here are the capabilities of each function in this sample. Then I can create an embedding that we can now take the words from like a disassembly that we're looking at. We can now kind of standardize that across an entire very large table and then we can see, okay, does this sample have this specific function capability, yes or no? No, okay, does this sample have this specific function capability, yes or no? Yes, it does, okay. Now the more like similarities we can find, then these are how we can start to cluster and group different samples belonging to different families, et cetera. You know, just based on embedding and how we can look at the assembly of programs. 
Okay, so this is just one data, data set that we can extract in our, in our sample. Another one, let's say if we look at like a PE header, what tool do I like? Uh, how about PE frame? So here's, uh, do I like this? No. Okay, let's go into, how about Rabin? Imports. All right. Okay, here's, here's something else. So as I mentioned, if you look at a binary, like those six main, you know, hexagons that we can extract from a binary sample. So one of those are your libraries, like your imports. These are the likely capabilities that that sample may have, right? So we can use a tool to extract a list of those. Then we can take this list, and, and as I mentioned, so here's kind of like in a row format, we can like glob these together and use these as like a speech that the malware may have based off of its capabilities. Now if we can see how to do this together again, as I mentioned, you can throw this into an embedding, and now we are ready for natural language processing to say, okay, what are the characteristics, the similarities, the semantics from this sample to other samples? This helps us in our classification. Right? So when we look at you know, all of these different files and formats, every file is different, every format is different, but we want to standardize like the details that we get from each file. Our file descriptor does that, and then it produces the metadata, this one. Okay, so you know, beware, it's Excel, or you know, just lots of lots of tables and lots of details and data. So this is kind of you go from again like hundreds of megabytes of details that we can extract from each sample. Now we start to standardize those, and then you can see, okay, here are the characteristics. Each column is a characteristic or an attribute or a feature that we can extract from each sample. Then we can start to uh, even visually see like the similarities between each sample. So if I go just to the right real quick, because um, you'll be able to see, oh, too fast. You'll be able to see this like once we release it. And yes, I know it's a lot of details, but I just want to say like, you know, when we do this natural language processing and malware analysis, it's, it's working, you know, on the raw data. And we can standardize this. Now we can throw it into models in order to help us um, figure out like what's going on. So as I said, I wanted to look at like the APIs, but maybe as I progress, we'll, we'll be able to see it. Okay, let me start to move a little. A little faster. Okay, so what we do um, from this standpoint, in fact, let me run up to this point. Kernel, restart. No, I don't want to restart. I already restarted. Okay, so let's see if it can come to this spot. All right, I think this was good. So um, we, we, I think I've already mentioned multiple times. So we take that data that we've standardized before. Now we bring it into our model or, you know, or analysis in order to help us say, okay, from these specific features and our feature engineering, what are we going to keep? And then how do we throw this into a model? So if I go further down just a little bit, because there's, there's lots of things that we just standard, you know, do whenever we're analyzing malware. Here is one view of a sample. Okay. So if I bring it in, these are the different attributes that we can load. You can see these like one by one. And then these are like the details from each malware sample, et cetera. I can scroll further down. Yeah, so like for instance, the import functions, you can see that it's now, we know the specific like feature name in order to go and extract the details and data that we want. So we're ready to pivot into various different models, et cetera. Now we continue all the way down into this data set until we, we reduce like the unnecessary data to be able to look, pivot into specific models. Because if we go towards applied machine learning, you have models that are created, but it needs things in a specific format. You know, here we still have other data that's not compatible for different models. So towards the bottom, you know, of this set, if we go towards our like feature engineering, we see what we want to keep, what's useful, we kind of recreate a, a, additional features, etc. We can finish and produce. Sorry, I'm going fast, and that's just because you know I'm I'm running out of time. Okay, yeah, there's something I wanted to, to point out. Okay, we can produce like our final like set ready to, to go into like any new model that, that kind of exists and accepts data in a specific tabular format. Um, you, you might have seen it because it scrolled real quick. So as I mentioned, when you do models, we do want to compare our results to industry standards. Now I'm automating this. So one of the standards that I'm using is Clam AV. And you know, that's because it's free um, and I can automate this. You know, I do not want to use interaction to scan each malware sample because we have hundreds of thousands of samples that we are scanning. So you, you might have seen it in red, but Clam AV, anyone have an idea of, of how, you know, good it is at detecting malware existing? 80%? 90%? What do we think? 
Yeah, I'm getting ahead enough, like 80, 90 percent, right? Because it's, it's open source, it's well known, it's free. Yeah, so um, in, in, our, in our work, Clam AV is actually in the 50 percent um, detection rate. And this was shocking. So I'm like, wait, it's Clam AV. You know, it's, yes, it is free, but it's been around for a while. As well as the samples that we're analyzing, these are like, some of them are, many of them are new, but some are old, like 2016, 2015. Clam AV is still not even able to analyze or, or like det determine these are true um, infected malware samples. So it's about a 54% success rate. Okay, this is, you know, as we say, one of our industry standards. So that means when we do our models and our classification and detection, we need to at least be on par or better than, you know, uh, industry standard 54% in order to say that, yes, this is useful and it can generalize towards um, feature, um, future data. Okay, so um, that's just that. And then here we're going to save our data set to a disk. Now we go into the modeling. So here we just have a, a, a notebook to better prepare our data get it ready for modeling, and now let's go into the modeling. Oops. All right, all right, all right. Okay, so if I go up here, oh, you know, I didn't start this. Do, do, do. Let me go. One second. Prepare, remove, process. Oh, you know what? This might be useful. Okay, so let's do this. Let's do run, selecting, run all above cells. Okay, and so hopefully it's able to um, run this real quick because when we now have our like our set that's ready to go into the model, we still need to analyze this and see, okay, what else do we need to process? Are there outliers that we need to deal with? Because each outlier is going to, con it may contaminate, um, it may contaminate your results. Okay, so I'm importing the data set. I want, um, all right, it should have. <sighs> okay, let me try and restart. Okay, I'm going to try and restart this kernel real quick and see if I can get it to run. If not, okay, all right. One, two, firewall, and, okay. That should be enough. Run, run. Okay, so it's starting to run. <sighs> Yeah, it's just one of those things. I'm not sure, because the other one was working. This one. Ooh. Okay, fine. I mean, I'm gonna have, yeah, I'm gonna have to move. Okay, give me one second. I have, I didn't export. Open with. Okay, I'll give it one last chance to see if this thing is... Ah, uh, okay, all right, this, I, this is good, this is good. Okay, so hopefully it's running just fine. So again, just, just standardized code, this is like boilerplate. Uh, how do you configure your dependencies inside the program? Like, um, which models are we going to import and capabilities to the function? Okay, so I want to go down towards when we actually load our data set. So it's going to be here. Run. No, run. Okay, so if I run, 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 okay, that looks good. All right, okay, this is better. Okay, so, you know, once again, we import our data set as we expected. We like to see this. It's a, you know, a good uniform set for, like, supervised um, machine learning. There are different tables that we'll, we'll explain kind of in a paper that we'll be releasing, but, you know, there's, there's not enough time to go through all of these. All right, so some of the things we start to look at, okay, what's our, our data coming in, and then I want to take... Okay, um, we don't have like null values, that's really good. Okay, let's start to process. Okay, here's one. All right, so here, like th this is a really small and an ugly chart, but we do need to gain like insight on, okay, what does the data actually look like such that we can kind of have a better feel of the, de of the details like our model is producing. So I just selected just a few of our, our um, features coming in. And then here, I'm just looking at how do those features like relate across the entire data set. Now, can anyone make a decision of like, is the date, uh, uh, like the details coming in, is there a normal distribution? Is there a skew, outliers? We, we can't really make a good decision here, and that's because this is really ugly. 
So if you see this, then that means your, your details of the data that you have is not standardized. We're going to have to use some sort of normalization and then outlier detection, et cetera, so we can kind of get a better like distribution, normal distribution of the data. Okay. So I, I kind of just say this because, you know, when we think of, of AI, it's like, hey, I just throw the details into a model, and it's not the case. You know, we have to do quite a bit of engineering on our features. But Okay, so this, this should not have happened. Dang. Just, okay, let, let me try it. This is fine. Okay, ah, I think I missed something. That's right. Okay. Yeah, so I'm not going to have time to explain some of the other things that we do, but I'm just saying since we look at the, the, the data, we now know that we do need to deal with outliers, so we handle um, some sort of outlier detection, and then we, we cap it's one way of transforming um, different details so we can get a better distribution. Okay, then I'm going to try and standardize the details here. And if that is the case, all right, this is, this is kind of better. So it's not great. We're not there yet. But at least from what we saw before, you know, just lines, we, we don't have a good distribution of the data. When we standardize the details, we kind of make one attribute to not over-dominate the other attributes in our set. Again, this is getting us ready for modeling. So if I look at this, now there's a better distribution of our, of our data towards here in the middle. So we do have different peaks. We do have a skew. So there's more time to be spent in our outline, our detection, et cetera. But as I mentioned, we're getting closer. We, let's, let's move forward to get into the modeling. Okay, so let's continue down. So in the set, like I, I do a standardization, and then I also do a normalization um, of the values. I wish I can talk about which is which, you know, and which is better, but et cetera. Okay. There's, there's, there's just no time. Okay, so here, as I'm saying, now let's prepare for the modeling. So this is where, like, we really talk about, hey, AI modeling. Well, this is finally where we get into taking the details that we've already standardized, we know it's good, and, and more closer for analysis. Okay, let's set up um, for our modeling. So at this case, I use a holdout. Um, so a, um, let me see if I can get rid of this. I wanted to zoom. Okay, so we use a holdout that um, when, when we do modeling or this, this type of analysis, we can have like details that are in our train that we learn from, and then we need to be able to determine like how does this generalize or how can we trust this on unseen de de details. So if I have like a hundred, let's just simple math, if I have a hundred malware samples that I want to detect, I will do my modeling on let's say 80 of those samples or 75, et cetera, and so I'll hold out the other 20 or 25. So when I learn on the model, I say, okay, you, you can like make different decisions. How good are you to true data, uh, details that you have not seen? So I take the details in my test, I throw it through the model, and I see what predictions does it make. And then hopefully we want to be as close as possible to the ground truth to know that, yes, this model is performing well. Right? So that's what our holdout is doing for us here. And then we go into our ensembling. So I mentioned the whole purpose, like really the whole purpose of what we're doing. Okay, is to be able to ensemble. So ensemble means taking multiple models together, like it could be heterogeneous models, homogeneous models of the same function or different functions. I'm really focusing on heterogeneous modeling. So again, we can use different types of architectures to standardize and make better improved decisions. Okay. So here, let's just use a few of already existing um, models that exist. I kind of um, put those here to say, okay, these are the models that we want to bring in, like linear regression or logistic regression for classification, support vector machine. Remember at the beginning of the presentation um, when we had like the classification of uh, machine learning, and then there was supervised, unsupervised. Underneath that, classification and regression, and then underneath those are the different models that we can now apply. So we take those models to help us make decisions, and that's what we're establishing here in an ensemble fashion. So it just means I can use multiple models at the same time and then look at um, the results that it provides for us. Okay. Now, okay, perfect. So really, this, this is finally, like, again, I'm going really fast, but you'll, you'll see it. I try to explain it in the code. So finally, when I have all of the details, we're now ready to do the modeling. And like, the modeling that we think is the exciting part, this is the most boring part. Like, I'm actually establishing, I set the, the different models that we want, and now I'm saying, okay, learn from the parameters and the attributes that are present. Start to see, okay, how close are you to the ground truth? Okay, and then start to generalize. So we take the training set um, that we've learned, uh, learned over each model. Then we say, okay, generalize over our test set, our holdout. And now let's look at your accuracy. Let's look at your precision. Let's look at things called recall. Um, I, 
I wish there's, there, there might be some time um, to explain some of those. Oh, no, there, there, there's no time. Okay, um, but let's, let's move forward. So as we can look, the results from each model, it tells us how accurate it is. Like given 80, 83% of the data um, that's in a, in a test set, it was able to properly classify those to the true ground truth. So 83% is actually pretty useful, although accuracy in a model is a, it's not the, it's not the me measure that we actually use to see is this model good or not. Accuracy can be fooled. Um, but for classification, we now care on like precision and recall. So precision means in a, in a, an entire set of samples, I have a hundred that are malicious. I have 25 or 30 that are not malicious. Now we need the model to, you know, properly distinguish is this malicious and which specific family it belongs to. So we can say the precision of, okay, I know these are malicious. And so how well did our model see that? Not only is it malicious, but it belongs to a specific family. That's kind of how precise um, the model is able to perform. So we do these for multiple models at the beginning, you know, and really we, 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 we wait a while. So I've kind of reduced this set so I can talk about it and then um, move forward, okay? Um, but when we're done, yeah, I'm just about out of time. Okay, so when it's finished, I should be able to look at each specific model and then in a uniform fashion, did I go too fast? This is what I wanted to see. Yeah, so in a uniform way, I can now come and look towards which models are the best and predictable for the data that we want. Okay, we now see a, like a generally 91%, if I can use a percentage, this model is like 91% effective on properly classifying different sets that we've seen in the past. This is a really good model to use to help us predict new uh, malware samples in the future. Because I mentioned, like, what's our, what was our baseline to see how good is our model? Baseline is like 54%, so that's a really low bar. Here we can already achieve a 91% and even get, um, you know, e and go even further. So um, I, I really, really, really wish I had time. I, I, I'm, I'm out of time. Oh, sorry, one, just one second, one second, one second. Okay, sorry, sorry. Okay, okay, okay I'm, I'm finishing. Um, I, I, I'll be around if there are any questions. I would love to have spoken about, like, um, the different ways that you do look at ensemble and making it better. But um, I do want to leave this slide. And so it is, if we have questions on how do you get started into this area, you know, I try and release like some good resources, free, and also some resources that cost, you know, money um, in order to, to like learn the detail in a format, in a formalized fashion. Um, but um, I also put like a few books here, really, really, in my opinion, really great resources that if you do just want to click on these and then like do some reading to see how do you apply these. I think these are like some of the best resources that I've seen to get started into AI and ML as well as some of the books, you know? So if you do want to um, look into these, like this is a really good one on data mining, as well as how to just immediately take a model, pivot, do some analysis, learn from it. That's kind of the best way to get started. You just hands-on, you learn and read, and then you grow from there. Okay, all right, I, I wish I had time, but I want to thank you all for your time. I think I'm, I'm out of time.